You might be using get component wrong, especially if your game contains multiple objects that need to communicate with multiple different systems, which quite frankly is pretty much every game. So in this video, we're going to talk about some advanced programming concepts and best practices that will explain how to get around some of the pitfalls of using get component everywhere, which will help your code stay as clean and performant as possible, especially as your game gets bigger and bigger. So typically what happens is you have some sort of game object. Let's say in this case, it's an enemy that's trying to look for the player and there is some sort of player data component that the enemy needs to access to get the health of the player or any other variables or data that it might require. So first of all, some people handle this by, let's say we have a variable called player here uh, using game object dot find and you'll give it the name of the object that you want to find. And this is there's a few problems with this, uh, especially if you're calling this in the update function, where essentially you're looping through the entire list of game objects every frame to find the one that you're looking for. That's what this find does. I, I think that's how it works. So it is a bit better to put this on your start function where it's only going to get run once. However, you're still searching over a lot of objects needlessly. And the way that people now will get around this is that they'll just create a variable reference in their component to the object that they want. So let's say game object player is going to be up here and I'll just make it public. You could make it serialized field instead. So this is fine as far as performance goes, but when I made my game error obscure, I started to notice it was very annoying to have to go back into Unity and assign all of the variables I wanted in all the different components. And this is also where you get your annoying null reference exception errors. So programmers use concepts called design patterns to solve similar problems to this. And there's different design patterns for different situations. And today we're going to look at a few of them. Of course, each has its own advantages and disadvantages. And there are many ways to do different things. But for now, let's talk about a pattern that will help us get around this very specific problem. But real quick, before we do, if you want to learn the ins and outs of game development beyond just the technical programming side, and believe me, there's a lot more than just programming, you should grab my free indie game dev starter guide in the description. Promise you, you'll find it useful. So I have this example player component, and we have one piece of information that's advantageous to us. And I guess this is only the case in a single player game, but we know that there is only one player. More specifically, we know that only one example player component will exist. Let's assume this component is the only player related component and that if the player has other components, then this will reference them. So we can take advantage of the quite odd feature of classes which is that they can actually reference themselves what that means is that we can create a variable in example player of type example player what's even crazier is that you can mix static functions with non-static functions so even though normally this appears as a component and is instantiated as an instance of this class we can access a static function as though we're not dealing with instances. And if you guys don't know much about classes and objects and what I'm talking about here, then I highly recommend learning about that first because you are going to need that in game development. But even if you don't know much about that, just as a refresher, basically it means that you're going to be able to call static functions off of this class, even though you're not creating a variable or a reference to the class, you can just call it globally, basically. So in my example enemy component, I can call static functions from the example player component, independent of any specific reference to that component that exists in our scene. And ultimately what this means for us is that we can create a static function that will return one and only one instance of example player. And every time you call this function, it will return the exact same and one and only reference that exists. And this, my friends, is exactly what a singleton pattern is. That's right. No more referencing player game object everywhere. So here's how you write the singleton. It's going to be of type example player because it is returning that. And actually this player should be private static as well. And we're going to treat this function as a property. So let's call this player in capitals. And this is just the syntax for properties for getters in C sharp. We're going to say get. So we're going to be calling this function from multiple different components. And basically what it has to do is check if this player instance is null. And if it is, it will find it and set it. And then every subsequent time that we call this function or property, it will return that already initialized instance. And the way we do that is we're just going to say if player is null, player equals, now we're going to use this find object of type function, which follows similar syntax to get components with the type in the angle brackets. And what this will do is this will find the first example player that it finds. And because there's only one, it's guaranteed that it will always find the correct player. And you might think that, well, doesn't that just do the same thing as game object.find? Well, 
to a point, except it's only ever going to be called once, not once per enemy or once per reference, but only once. From then on, we return player. So if player already exists, it's not going to call find the object of type. It's going to just return the existing player. Now, what about situations where you don't have just one of some object? Like for example, what if the player is fighting an enemy and kills the enemy? Now, maybe we have some pseudo code here saying like, if you see some enemy, Raycast, get component, enemy data, you know, and then like maybe you kill the enemy or something, right? How do you avoid using get component on objects that you don't know necessarily which one you're going to come across? And this question applies to multiplayer. What happens if you have multiple players and you can't use a singleton? So how do we actually get around this problem? Well, it turns out there's actually a perfect design pattern for this exact problem. And I recently added it to my current project, which I hope to be able to reveal to you all in February or March. So stay tuned. And it has to do with the fact that C sharp actually allows us to pass functions as parameters to other functions and store functions as variables or store functions in arrays or maps. And that might sound super complicated, but actually it's not. And I'll explain. So I have this class here called global event system, and I just renamed it that as you can see, I got it from this GitHub repo, which I will link in the description. And the important things that this class has are this dictionary. And if I understand this correctly, it just maps any type at all to some list of functions. And if you don't know what this is, well, if you have an array, an array maps consecutive integers to some data. For example, if you have an array of game objects, you'll have element zero is the first game object, element one is the second game object. So think of this dictionary as an array, except instead of mapping integers, it maps types. So you might have something like the game object maps to one list, the player data component maps to another list, integer maps to another list, except we're using specific types of types and the list that they each map to is a list of functions and you can see up here this delegate void event listener delegate void means that we're actually creating a variable that is a function and if we create functions that follow the pattern of event listener so if they're passed in some parameter that satisfies this event info type they will count as event listener types and i know that's probably very confusing but what matters ultimately is the way that this is used I think if you just understand how it's used, then you'll be able to use it in your own games and have super clean code and never have to use get component again. So the first function here is register listener. And the way that this works is you just literally pass in a function and some event info for some event. And then the second function here, fire events will trigger every single function that is on that list map to that type. So here's the event info class. It's literally just an empty abstract class. And if I go here to our example, example player, if I just create a new class, it's called player example info, extends, let's make it public, extends event info. And actually let's rename this. I'm going to say that this gets called when the player attacks. So let's do player attack example event. And so this is the event that we're calling every time we attack an enemy. And so what would happen under this, whatever if statement that we, that we would actually have down here is you would call that static function, so global event system dot fire event of type event info. And we can pass in a new player attack example event. And you might be wondering, well, why are we passing in these empty classes? Well, you could put some sort of data in them, but in our case, it's fundamentally an identifier for an event. And if we go back to our example enemy, I can actually register a listener. And first of all, let's say that we have a function here, get attacked, or let's say on attack listener. It needs to take in that event type. And we can basically just do something simple, like say, I am dead. And on your start function, you would call that other static function, global event info dot register event. What is the type of event that you're registering? Well, we're registering this player attack example event, or rather a listener for that event. And the listener we're registering is on attack listener. So again, when this event is fired, this function will trigger. And you might be thinking, well, what's the point of this? Doesn't this just add so much more overhead to my programming? Well, in a sense, there is a little bit more overhead, but overall it strips down a lot of the programming time 
And furthermore, it keeps your code organized and separated and compartmentalized, which in programming we call decoupled. So the player is only handling things that the player should handle. The player is doing player actions and the enemy is corresponding to those actions. So if you're digging in your game code and you're like, oh, I need to change the way that the enemy works because there's a small issue or I want to implement something new. Maybe your player script is like, if it's this type of enemy, do this. Or if it's this type of enemy, or if he has this much health or this much that, do this instead of this. Well, now you just have this event that you fire and now the enemy is just listening for that event. And if you need to handle it differently for different enemies, you can use the event info. And something that you should keep in mind is that you'll have multiple enemies registering these events, right? Any enemy that uses this enemy component is going to have this event registered for it. So if the player attacks one enemy, what's going to happen is it's going to fire that event and then the global event system will run every single listener on that event and so every single enemy will take damage. And so a classic event info template is going to have the game object that you are actually hitting and you're probably going to create a constructor for that and pass in your hit object here whatever you're hitting and then in your handler before you say am i dead you're going to check event info dot target to see if it equals the enemy that's actually checking it and then and only then it will actually run that code so if you made it this far hopefully i've convinced you of the merits of these kinds of programming practices obviously this is a pretty advanced programming concept and if you've made it this far it means you're ready to watch this video next because if you're making a game then there's a lot more to it than just programming and a lot of us technical people will get lost in that so that video will help you to mitigate as many of those issues and pitfalls as possible to help you successfully release your game understand what stage you you should be at at different points in your game development journey and officially become a solo indie game developer. Thanks for watching and God bless.